This past Thursday, millions of Americans celebrated Thanksgiving Day, marking the beginning of a month-long holiday season, which for most will, will no doubt be a busy time, full of festivities and celebrations with our co-workers and our friends and our family. Over the last few days, some, if not most of us, collectively paused over a good meal, taking a moment to inventory the blessings in our lives, doing our best to put the reality of any world, uh, real world challenges that we have right now and our real world circumstances on hold for a few days. Some who live far away from loved ones or, or can't escape an unpleasant reality in their life likely found Thanksgiving Day to be a little bit difficult or disappointing. And then, of course, there's those among us who, who went through the motions of celebrating the holiday this year, bearing an unquenchable longing for someone important in their lives whose time on earth ran out this past year. Nonetheless, with God's help, some from all these groups managed to look at the day with a biblical perspective, approaching the misfortunes of the year with a 1 Thessalonians 5.18 mindset that says rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In my mind, people that are able to live this way are Thanksgiving heroes. Whatever this year's Thanksgiving holiday brought your way, I hope all of you, at least in, in part, uh, had an enjoyable weekend, finding ample reason to thank God for His bountiful spiritual blessings and faithful provision. As for me, now that I've celebrated Thanksgiving yesterday, first thing tomorrow, everything goes back to normal. That is, except for one thing. What's the one thing? Despite Katie's impressive efforts yesterday at my house to empty all the bowls and platters and casserole dishes, our refrigerator is slam full of Thanksgiving leftovers. And with no end to this culinary dilemma, in sight, I hate to even guess how many days I'm going to be eating the same thing over and over and over again. Nonetheless, since, it's, since the Bible says that it's God's will that we be thankful, once this service is over today, I'm going to go home, grab a plate, and I'm going to viciously attack those Thanksgiving leftovers. Furthermore, I'm determined to keep at that until I can plant my flag on the black wall of our refrigerator behind that stack of full-covered mystery dishes in our refrigerator. Pastor Chris, there's no rush. If you don't want to eat turkey again, eat a hot dog or something. Those leftovers will be fine for a few more days. As accurate as that may be, please understand that in the final relegation of our Thanksgiving leftovers, it's a time-sensitive issue. Why? Because four weeks from now, we're going to fill that refrigerator up again, only this time it's going to be leftover Christmas goodies. Woo-hoo, now you're talking. I like Christmas goodies. I'll eat turkey, but it's not necessarily because I love it. It's because Dee Dee tells me I will. But when it comes to Christmas, you can put me outside in the rain and the snow and the mud, and as long as I got a plate of buffalo chicken wings and a half a dozen hot out of the oven sausage cheese balls, I'm happier than a dead pig in the sunshine. As citizens of heaven who reside on earth for the time being, as it is every other day, we're challenged to make our holiday seasons all about God and His Son, Jesus. And with that in mind, while I've never made Christmas about lavish gifts or... Uh, Trips to Disney World, in my mind, a holiday feast is a picture of God's abundance that I can wrap my teeth around. But before we get too far into this morning's message, I have a confession to make. I saw some of y'all say, oh no, what did he do? With all the years that I've been publicly complaining about leftovers over the last two days, I've been secretly working my way to that elusive back wall of our refrigerator with the enthusiasm of a squirrel sitting on the rail of a backyard bird feeder. Because the truth of it is, is I actually like leftovers. Now, I can't tell y'all how good that, that feels to finally get that out. The Bible says that the truth will set you free, and I've just told the truth this morning, and I feel a whole lot better now. 
While I had initially planned to use this morning's message to transition into the Christmas season, by midday Monday, this past Monday, I knew that the Holy Spirit wasn't quite done with Thanksgiving yet. And with that, he, he soon led me to some scripture in John chapter 6 that concerns a, a familiar story that we all know. Before we read this scripture, I want to point out that the passage just so happens to touch on the subjects of Thanksgiving and leftovers. So where are we? Jesus had just healed a man who had been lame for 37 years. And when the Jewish leaders found out, they aggressively began to hassle him for working on the Sabbath. So what did Jesus do? Well, he, he decided to really tick them off by telling them that he was the son of God. And then picking up in John 6, verse 1, John writes, After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. After, afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Now you can ask anybody who attended Sunday school or a vacation Bible school when they was a kid, and they can tell you the details of this story because it's widely known and it's a significant miracle. They know that the disciples, uh, that Jesus asked the disciples to feed a large crowd. They know that the disciples said that it, that would be impossible. They know that a boy in the crowd had five hunks of bread and two small fish with him. They know that the boy gave his lunch to Andrew and Jesus takes his offering, thanks God for it, and miraculously uses it to feed over 5,000 people. If you do an online search using the term, the five most amazing miracles of Jesus, you'll usually find the story of the five loaves and two fish somewhere in that top five ranking. Furthermore, if you expand your search to include Old Testament miracles, you'll usually find that this miracle and the miracle of God's provision of manna in the wilderness and Jesus turning water into wine are three supernatural miracles that consistently rank high among believers in popularity. With that, I should point out that all three of these miracles relate to God's provision for human needs. But among all 37 miracles attributed to Jesus across the four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000 is the one that prevails over all the others in terms of uniqueness. What makes this miracle so unique? First, beside the, the resurrection, it's the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. Second, while the Bible spotlights that number 5,000 in the original Greek language, we know that 5,000 only refers to the men in the crowd. So the actual number present could have plausibly exceeded three or four times that. In any case, more individuals witnessed this miracle than all the other miracles. Third, the miracle of the loaves and fishes is the only miracle where someone other than Jesus contributed anything to the action he performed. In this case, it was the little boy that brought the lunchbox. 
It's also the only miracle where Jesus asked the disciples for assistance. He asked Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Likewise, it's the only miracle where Jesus asked the disciples to serve him. In, in other gospel accounts, Jesus says, bring me the loaves and fish. In John's version, which we're in today, he says, tell everybody to sit down. Finally, this is the only miracle Jesus performed where the people were ready to proclaim him as their king right then and there. So this pop-up, all-you-can-eat fish special was a pretty big deal. Again, all of us know this story well, and, and that may be one of the reasons that it usually ranks among the popular miracles in the Bible. That said, when we encounter a well-known Bible story like this one, you know, we might be tempted to skip over it and move on to other scripture we perceive to be more challenging. So as the Holy Spirit drew me towards this passage this week, I realized a need for us to exercise caution, making sure that we don't ever let our perceived expertise cause us to miss out on the full richness of a biblical account like this and the other underlying lessons we can learn if we take the time to dig beneath the surface. I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. So yes, this scripture is about an amazing miracle. He took a little bit of food and fed all these people. Jesus took what the disciples saw as nothing and made something big out of it. But what else can we learn through this story? To find out, I, I want to go back to verses 5 through 7 and read those two verses again. It says, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed all these people. And then in, in verses 8 and 9, Scripture goes on to say, Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with, with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with a huge crowd? So Andrew had gone out to pass the hat, and when he came back, all he had managed to collect was the contents of a sack lunch that somebody's mama made. What good is that? I'm going to ask you, who do these two morons sound like? Well, I think they kind of sound like me. Because like Philip Andrew, I, I'm a numbers guy, and, and as I analyze any challenges that come my way, I consistently look at the logistics and available resources, and I often find that the math associated with whatever it is just don't add up. Yet I obviously haven't missed any meals or ever experienced long-term absences of other needs or even wants in my life, having learned over time that the Lord provides all we need in His time and according to His will. And in essence, that's the same miracle that the disciples saw that day. That day, a, a pressing need greatly exceeded the available resources. And after doing everything humanly possible to try to fill that need, the disciples failed to complete their assignment. Yet somehow Jesus made it happen. How did he make it happen? Well, you know, supernaturally, of course. But what I want you to see is the action Jesus took and the results of his action. First, in verse 10, he says, Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. And afterward, he did the same with the fish. And what was the result of that? So let's skip down to verses 12 and 13 and read those again. It says, After everyone was full, Jesus told the disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. That's a biblical account of some Thanksgiving leftovers. The point I'm trying to make here is that Jesus took what little he had to work with, and before he did anything else, he gave thanks for it. And when he did, God responded, and he did so in great abundance. A few weeks ago, we looked at some words that Jesus spoke found in John 10.10. 10, and uh, this morning, I'm going to use the amplified version of that. Jesus says, the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. 
I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. In the kingdom of God, in whatever it is, there's always enough. However true enough, sometimes God's provision may seem to be just one of, of the bare necessities. Nonetheless, we know that God's not stingy, and we know that he's not incapable of providing great things because in Ephesians 3.20, Paul says, not all, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So according to his will and purpose, when we ask God for our daily bread, more often than not, he exceeds our expectations. Amen. Have you seen that in your life? Throughout the Bible, we see a God of radical generosity. At his command, we see empty nets that are suddenly overflowing with fish and bone-dry vats pouring out endless cups of sweet wine. And in today's scripture, we see God take two minnows and turn them into a fish fry like one of them like they have around the corner at this Methodist church up here. If we're honest with ourselves, in today's material world, these stories feel too good to be true, too good to be true. And that's because in terms of human ability and resources, these stories are too good to be true. However, the Holy Spirit placed within us allows us to see that God is always doing, always going above and beyond what we can hope for or imagine, and it blows our minds. Real world realization of the abundant life Jesus promises begins when we receive the gift of God's grace that leads to eternal life. Then as we continue to receive this lifelong supply of God's grace through faith in the redeeming work of the cross, the ever transforming change brought about in our lives can be likened to a seed that begins to grow as it's watered by our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. As we mature in faith, what happens? We begin to sow seeds of our own and then go and plant them in others, and we allow others to plant their seeds in us. The miracle we've looked at this morning reminds us that living a life of abundance is part of the very reason that Jesus came. He came to give us a life that overflows with his presence and his goodness. And yet... You know, we look around in, the, in our community and the world we live in, and sometimes it seems like we live in a world of lack. Thursday afternoon, Dee was cooking, and I ran over to Ingalls to pick up some last-minute items just before they were closing at 4. And when I got out of my truck, I, I encountered a gauntly-looking man who was desperately looking for something to eat. Now, I took care of his immediate need, and while what I offered was more than what he had, it was far less than what you could call abundant. The fact is, as I celebrate holidays with a feast, there's rampant hunger in this world, and poverty exists. So, so what does abundant life really mean? How do we rejoice always? How do we pray continually? How do we give thanks in all circumstances? Unfortunately... I don't have the answers to some of those questions. But with that said, what I really want you to see is that there's a clear biblical connection between abundance and thanksgiving, and it's not what we think it might be. Now, most of us closed up shop this past Thursday to spend the day, again, taking that inventory of blessings over the last 12 months, and then we offered God our thanksgiving for the things we identified as blessings. In practice, there's nothing wrong with that, and that's what our forefathers had in mind when they instituted the holiday. But quite often, we, we treat tangible blessings and abundance as a key that unlocks the door of our hearts and opens them to a willingness to give God thanks for the perceived blessings in our lives. In other words, we look for the good things in our lives, and then when we find them, we enthusiastically say, Wow, I'm so blessed. Thank you, God. But the bad things, not so much. So we must understand that in the truth of God's word, it's the other way around. It's our gratitude to God that unlocks the abundant life that he wants us to have. Now, y'all just bear with me while I make the case. With a heart of thanksgiving, a little becomes more than enough. With a heart of thanksgiving, denial becomes patient acceptance 
Chaos becomes order and confusion becomes clarity. With a heart of thanksgiving, a stale bologna sandwich becomes a feast and the shack that we live in becomes a home. When we follow Paul's advice and thank God in all circumstances, we find purpose in our past, peace in our present, and hope in our future. Amen? In the last 12 months, some of us have lost husbands, wives, children, siblings, and pets, and declining health is limited where some of us can go and what we can do when we get there. Consequently, when I look back on the last 12 months and how tough it's been, I admit that in many ways it feels unnatural to say, thank you, Lord. Yes, God has given us his gift of grace through Jesus, but considering what's transpired within this body in the last year, it seems much easier for us to feel discouraged and even ungrateful. So what do we do? Again, I love you guys, and I badly wish I could answer all those questions for you, but there's days when I struggle to find and maintain a heart of thanksgiving myself. However, what I can do this morning is show you four things I found in Jesus' miraculous feeding of the 5,000 this past week that offer us good reasons to give God our thanks even when we don't feel like it. First, the miracle of the 5,000 shows us that Jesus always operates with compassion. He performed a spectacular miracle on the hills of facing great grief himself over the loss of his beloved cousin and friend, John the Baptist, who had just been executed at the order of King Herod. Yet, just before performing this miracle, Matthew's version of this event tells us that Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Despite personal grief, Jesus knew that his time on earth was short, so he pressed on to do all that God had called him to do, and he's still working like that in our lives today. He understands the kind of pain and struggles that we're facing right now, and he's never too busy or too distant to care. He knows the grief that Miss Wanda and Miss Mary and Miss Dee Dee feel today because he's experienced it himself. And yet, what does the Word of God say? It says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. That's amazing. So I encourage you to give God thanks today in whatever your circumstance is. The second thing I found in the miracle of the 5,000 this past week that offers us good reason to give God our thanks is that Jesus is much bigger than any problem we will ever face. Again, that Matthew 14 version of this miracle says, As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. In essence, Jesus told his disciples to take their eyes off the problem and the circumstances and focus on the answer. What was the answer to the problem? Jesus was the answer to the problem, and he's still the answer to every problem that we face today. But as we wait, you know, sometimes his answers, they, they don't come immediately. They, they come according to God's will and God's perfect timing. But again, as we wait, our circumstances don't change our purpose. In a world filled with darkness and fear, Jesus has sent us out in the power of his spirit with instructions to be salt and light, bringing the very bread of life that makes an eternal difference in the souls of human beings. Circumstances may change, but God's given purpose remains. In the uncertainty of changing circumstances, Thank God for your unchanging purpose. Amen. The third thing I found in the miracle of the 5,000 this past week that offers us good reason to give God thanks is that whenever we're running on empty, Jesus only asks that we bring him whatever we have. That we bring him whatever we have. In my mind, obedience... Uh, let me run back up here. Okay, when the disciples returned and told Jesus that the only food to be found was the contents of a little boy's sack lunch, Jesus immediately said what? Bring it to me. 
Bring it to me. I'm sure they thought that Jesus had, had lost his mind. Nonetheless, the disciples obeyed, and, and this single act of obedience ushered in the way that Jesus chose to perform an amazing miracle that we're still talking about today. So again, circumstances change, but this truth remains. Obedience paves the way for great things to happen. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Jesus says, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. So in my mind, obedience to this command insists on, on having a heart of thanksgiving. And with unwavering obedience to the statutes in this verse, you might just witness a miracle in your own circumstances. The fourth and final thing I found in the miracle of the 5,000 that offers good reason to give God thanks is that Jesus multiplies whatever we bring to him with a heart of thanksgiving. Whatever we bring to him with a heart of thanksgiving. 5,000 hungry men and their families. That's a lot of mouths to feed. Especially with a, a, a small food offering like that. But that was all he had. Yet through Jesus, it was enough. In fact, it was more than enough. You know, studying this miracle this past week has not only strengthened my faith, but it's also brought me some renewed hope for the days that lie ahead. And I pray that in some way that I've been able to pass some of that hope along to you. Before we go, I want to make sure that, that we're all clear concerning the source of our hope. And to do that, let's take one more look at a verse from Ephesians 3 that we've already looked at this morning. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. With that verse in mind, we should never underestimate the life-changing power of any willful offering given to God with a heart of thanksgiving. God is exceedingly abundantly and lovingly able to make whatever it is into more than enough. He is able. He is able. Before we go, can I get y'all to say that with me? He is able. Amen. Amen. Father God, as we leave here today, let us do so with hearts overflowing with glad thanksgiving. I left every person present, every person you have placed in my care and every person watching online asking that no matter where we are in life at this moment, that you take our brokenness, our grief, our pain, our loss, our doubt, our short supply, and our inadequacies, and breathe your blessing and favor over us. May you take all that we willingly offer you with hearts of thanksgiving and multiply it to your glory. Amen. Y'all remember to connect, equip serve and encourage one another and we'll see y'all next week.